did you get to read the case? I've gone, huh, I've gone through that case, right? That's the NEGM, the one that you shared now. Yes. Um, Not yeah. 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 Limits powers and limits of classification. That's the only one, right? So I've gone through it, yeah. So uh, the idea was that we would discuss the case and talk about the powers and limits of classification as the title says. And uh, that itself, uh, as in the first time I read the, uh, the, the case report, I was like, it, it actually made me rethink um, on how, how we do our classification and actually the powers and limits of classification. So actually, uh, that that's why I, I I mean it's one of my favorite case reports, and uh, so uh, just for the sake of people who are going to watch this recording, uh, the case is uh, from NEGM and uh, it 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 starts with a man who comes in with abdominal pain, uh, and uh, the nurse does a triage. Uh, and finds that uh, this person is obese and uh, has a BP 180 over 100 or something like that. And uh, also notices that he was, he's a transgender man. And um, the patient actually tells the nurse that he had a positive urine pregnancy test that day morning and was wondering whether it could be a false positive or is it a true positive and uh, the nurse took a drug history and found out that the uh, the man was taking testosterone supplements in the past and antihypertensives in the past but then he had stopped taking those because the insurance cover had expired and he was not taking those. Also, he's not been having menstrual cycles at all since uh, many months. Um, and then I guess um, uh, that was the, uh, so the nurse then uh, uh, triaged that person into a not so urgent case category and uh, asked for a lot of blood tests, including a human chorionic gonadotropin test, and and left uh, left uh, him. So the assumption was that. Okay. So at least just come. So the assumption with which uh, the nurse, the professional diagnosis that the nurse made was that this person had not taken antihypertensive medications and therefore has high BP and also uh, mm, yeah so that, that was the, the, the assumption that uh, they made and then later a doctor comes in uh, ED doctor comes in with the HCG report which turned out to be positive and examines the person again and finds out that uh, apart from being obese, uh, this person has a gravid abdomen and uh, confirms that uh, he is pregnant and therefore, uh, uh, and then does uh, try try a ultrasound. I mean, uh, because the BP is high, they plan for a, a cesarean section and uh, uh, in Somewhere in between, they figure out that the baby's heartbeat could not be picked up. And uh, so they realize, okay, perhaps the baby has died and uh, allow vaginal delivery. So that's how the case progresses. Essentially, the, the, the question that NEGM asks us is, uh, in fact, uh, whether can you share the screen? No, I don't think I'll share the screen because uh, 
uh, if the copyright on this is not clear. Although I don't know if I'm breaking the copyright by talking about it. So, uh, uh, so NEGM just discusses what classification is and the purposes of classification. Why human beings tend to classify things? The powers. Uh, nobody says that classification is bad. Uh, it allows human beings to process a lot of information without getting confused. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps it's a cognitive uh, skill that humans evolved to use. Uh, but then there are limits of classification like this case uh, brings out in that uh, uh, if if the person were a cis uh, woman, uh, there wouldn't have been any confusion on ordering uh, someone who comes with a positive urine pregnancy test and a high BP and uh, missed uh, menstrual cycles for the past many months would have directly been sent to the obstetric department and a fetal ultrasound or all those pregnancy related tests would have happened very quickly and would have been triaged to be an urgent case. So that is the point at which uh, I would like to stop and ask Swati and uh, you uh, about uh, your experience of classification being uh, the, the, the limitations of classification. So I, I think uh, the powers of classification is kind of obvious in that it allows us to process. Uh, I mean, you could even talk about the powers of classification. So. Right. Even though you did highlight the powers of classification, <coughs> especially in such a setting where it is in a casualty based scenario, right? The, the only way it goes forward is it sustains itself is because of triaging, isn't it? So there it's a very, I, I would disagree. I mean, I think classification is very much necessary and to like make it a systemic thing where you actually rethink every classification is not possible. So it should be like very much case scenario wise. For example, you did highlight a scenario where the classification it it itself turned out to be a con and you couldn't actually save a life and you know here you yeah in such situation right more of like more importance in uh, it's very specific where patients you need to rethink you need to make a judgment call right there to understand whether you need to give more weightage to the patient whatever he's saying to give more weightage to the patient experiences and his symptoms like it's an immediate judgment you need to take because many times it might actually turn out to be false positive, right? I I don't think I quite understood. Can you? Huh. Yeah. So I, I, you got it? Like yeah, I think what you're saying is um, in a place where there is limited amount of time we can spend on a person. Uh, already existing classifications help in managing patients better, managing most patients better, but uh, thinking like this in a systematic way might not be possible is what you're saying, is that right? Prudent enough to take a judgment call right then and there, whether you want to like use like different methodologies like maybe involving the patient, like giving weightage to the patient's symptoms, like deciding its gravity, right? So there, I feel the nurse could have given more weightage because he was a, a transgender man and he had stopped his testosterone. And that's a judgment call that she needed to take there. It's very mm -hmm. patient. -based. Sorry, I think I... Uh, can you repeat the last part? information that the patient had stopped his testosterone taking his testosterone and he had absence menstrual cycles with actually abdominal pain those three were the warning signs that she had to like perceive
are you talking about the triad classification specifically here in which i was talking about the symptoms which with which she had to pick up that it is actually severe i think i missed the initial bit did did he actually mention that he is a trans man yes he did i mean it was on his record and he did yeah he actually told uh, he was on testosterone and ha huh. then it's kind of so negative. the the uh the the comment nijm makes about uh, that is that the nurse was not neg negligent in fact the nurse ordered uh, hcg with the possibility in mind that it could be pregnancy and uh, perhaps it's uh, the judgment uh, that this person is uh, had had been on testosterone and uh, it's just a mis hypertension uh, yeah i mean uh, in hindsight it might have it, it might appear to us that it was an easy call but on at that spot uh, the the sympt even with the possibility of pregnancy in our mind we would have made a, or the nurse would have made a judgment that this is perhaps not pregnancy and decided is is that what you are uh, saying i was uh, i was actually thinking that it might have been negligent but also now rethinking it it might have been that you know it's just that lack of awareness we have been taught and trained to uh, uh, to do examination on women whom we suspect uh, that they are pregnant right that's just an inbuilt awareness in our head like to think of it as a trans man and then to do for uh, abdominal examination it's not that awareness is not inbuilt in us right so with that lack of awareness there also flows the inhibition we won't be knowing how to approach a trans man we won't be knowing about the sensitivity with all those cases i feel if i were also in that nurse case i too might have followed the way she did even mm. me being aware of the sensitive issues of trans people mm. so uh, as a general uh, this thing like let's let's pause this case for a second and uh, ask ourselves if we have examples of uh such a classification so uh, nijm does mention a few about race and uh, uh, race and gender and age race and age uh about how just... our classification systems uh are limiting our uh, care so do, do we have any such examples from our own practice or experience i think major major classification that we do is uh, have uh, someone some person having an organic cause versus functional cause where uh, i mean when once we make it a point to see that there is no organic cause at all suddenly we uh, we try to uh, devalue most of the symptoms that the person has and say that you don't have anything uh, you're all right uh, there's nothing in your scan there's nothing in your uh, uh, in in the examination findings so you're okay but the the symptoms may, uh, either due to uh, what do you call it functional functional or Uh, psychosomatic uh, somatoform uh, symptoms they could still be symptoms that they, they are still symptoms that they are facing so i don't know if this comes under classification but it does let physicians take it lighter one point i wanted to add when akshay actually asked about if you've seen it in your practice and so this the most thing i have seen repeatedly is with gender when any woman walks in with having abdominal pain or giddiness or any other symptom right everyone most of i've seen most of the male physicians 
just take it lightly saying that it's either anxiety issues or it might it's mostly psychosomatic form and yeah this is a common trait that i've seen like even though maybe statistically women have more psychosomatic kind of illness that doesn't mean you take it uh less lightly all the time because i i know people who have gone there with actual genuine complaints like she had an asthma attack and the physician they told that it's just an anxiety attack and he sent her back mm -hmm. yeah it wasn't a severe asthma life threatening but it it actually she did have a mild asthma attack so and then later she had to go to a different hospital because of it mm. this is gender based thing so i mean is 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 stereotype ste uh, uh, stereotyping and uh, this classification related in that sense wherein uh, when you classify you are stereotyping you are attributing certain or are they different classification and stereotype uh, distinct entities so uh, i mean i'll make myself clear my question is do you think classification automatically leads to stereotyping or that uh, uh, classification and stereotyping are different things wherein uh, classification everyone does but stereotyping is only done by uh, people who i mean it's a did you get I, my i think um, i am not very clear with what classification exactly means here maybe that's why i'm missing so here uh, the in this particular case the classification mm -hmm. is that this is a woman right and women have a different set of problems and men have a different set of problems. that is a classification okay it's a false classification no it's a the right classification this is a woman is a classification right okay i mean uh, in in the in our original case the mm -hmm. classification issue was that this is a man so he was a trans man they classified him as Huh, man. There, the problem was that there was no category for people like him. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this also, this is also a classification problem in that. Uh, 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 I mean. So it's a social thing, not a medical thing. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to understand if if classification is related to stereotypes, as in is classification or is stereotype a form of classification, wherein uh, I, I don't know. Am I even making sense? <laughs> okay anyhow uh, i'll just move on and uh, i'll give my uh, ex examples from my this thing uh, where uh, the kind of classifications i have uh, seen is one uh, of course gender related and uh, other than that the class related economic class related there are a lot of uh, times where people in a certain class are thought to never have certain diseases like infectious diseases uh, leprosy for example or tuberculosis uh, 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 they are not tested for leprosy even though they have obvious uh, i mean uh, obvious as in uh, say a patch with uh, hypo hypo sensations and uh, tuberculosis for or for that matter or uh, uh assuming so this has happened a lot in uh, when we when we were working in cim that tribal people won't have mental health issues or tribal people won't have non communicable diseases because they lead a healthy lifestyle and not checking them for diabetes hypertension so uh, i think those are also other i mean all kinds of all forms of classification so i think now it comes back to the point i was trying to make Uh, are we are we do we have stereotypes for each kind of classification and is is it these stereotypes that limit classifications uh maybe it's the i don't know the word which i'm actually thinking it might be stereotype and also i feel it's being like lack of awareness about many social issues is also a confounding factor which makes us and probably uh, taking the evidence as it is like and not questioning what exists for example if we have been seeing patients um in tribal area without diabetes hypertension 
it doesn't mean they do not have but we need to question is it really so so probably um, it's when we don't question that becomes stereotype if we blindly use classification it becomes stereotype because i don't see classification itself being a bad person here so uh, i think that uh, that's an interesting point you raise because stereotypes uh, may be uh, i mean i may be wrong here and i'm happy to hear you calling me but stereotypes may be arising from a, a, a predominant uh, what is it called vulnerability to a certain kind of characteristic right like or to be to put it bluntly uh, people may Uh, be stereotype towards women that they will have anxiety attacks because a lot of women have anxiety attacks is that does that make sense what you said right i think all the points together they lead to this a stereotyping people and b a lack of the social situation here and also not critically uh, analyzing a situation like swati told right because ha huh, all together no don't you agree that they add up to the problem not right. just yeah. so uh, so what i was trying to the point i was trying to make was so if you agree with me that stereotypes uh, arise from uh, the differences in uh, different kind of people like women tend to have slightly more anxiety attacks then uh, classification uh, and stereotypes are related in that so whenever we classify we always talk about exceptions right mm. and uh, so that is where this uh, stereotype also comes in stereotype applies to some amount of people but then there are exceptions and the exceptions are very 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 numerous like a lot lot of exceptions mm. but it's the same uh, same pattern like you classify people based on what is common but then there could be exceptions mm. and especially when it comes to uh, uh, the things that we classically call stereotypes there are a lot of exceptions like v- women stereotypes to women are so wrong because the <laughs> exceptions are too numerous mm. but then the stereotypes to say a uh, transgender men or, uh, or like this uh, um uh, wherever the exceptions are long, wrong, less we call it classification and the same things wherever exceptions are there wherever there are a lot of ex, ex, exceptions we call it stereotyping wherever the exceptions are very few we call it classification with uh, a few exceptions i feel it's not to do with the number but with the con- connotation that comes with the n- names classification and stereotype where classification has space for exceptions also to a large extent but stereotype is trying to actually delete these exceptions it's trying to think of it as a mainstream versus non mainstream hmm. i agree with swati here like huh. because in classification there is always space for others and the uh, further classification that, yeah small atypical etc etc things it doesn't give importance to one versus the other hmm at least okay and because yeah like with stereotyping right it's a common tendency because we don't reanalyze situation we just generalize that uh, stereotype which has been inbuilt through our social upbringing to all populations so any girl who comes in the middle of the night with some problem we tend to think maybe it's anxiety attack or attention seeking or mm-hmm. like how akshay told with exceptions right so any elder woman who has like uh, a dis- not dysmenorrhea any elderly woman who has like discharge per vagina we would never even think as hiv as a, a common thing even though she might be telling that she has sexual repeated sexual history Th- that's where our social thinking our culture like inhibits us from rethinking and that should be a conscious effort to always rethink in a social perspective like rethink our social perspectives with the case like presenting to us i think that point of 
thinking from a social perspective will solve so many problems right right even in the case that you are discussing hmm. if when you evidence was there yeah yeah so essentially what i am uh, uh, what i am uh, some uh, if uh, tell me if my summary is correct uh, classification uh, means there are a lot of cognitive biases wherein you have learned that uh, uh, this is this things are common in this is this is classes mm -hmm. this is things are common in this is classes that those are cognitive biases because you have related in your brain neurons with them uh with those classes you may have uh, problems but stereotyping and uh, uh, uh and even in classification uh, there is also a layer of social biases where uh, uh it's not about what you've learned mm -hmm. in medical uh, knowledge but also about uh, the entire cultural background mm -hmm. and so uh, even uh, so uh, how this may differ is that if you put the same medical content in us and india mm. or in a different country and a different culture uh, they would have the same amount of classification errors but then the i mean uh, cognitive errors but then social errors may be different, different. and uh, yeah. uh, does that uh, make sense kind of just summarize uh, can i like take it further and ask because you mentioned that in other countries a uh, social bias is less right Do you think in a country okay. like India? I don't think he said less, but it's different. Okay. I think okay. social errors would be still there, but are yeah. different. different from one another. Yeah, but question was. I'll go on. Yeah, your question. So I was going to say, right? In a country of India, where in our medical education, at least till I graduated. we were never even thought about like many concepts like social accountability and health equity like addressing each and every one with the same amount of care so do you think with such a background thinking in our mentality and also with the huge case burden can we actually think in a proposed way that you were actually telling both of you were telling like those are like huge barriers to uh look at a patient like go beyond the social bias and to critically analyze the patient like i was i'm just highlighting the barriers in the indian uh, system right now to actually to not classify or not stereotype a patient so you're saying that the number the barrier you are pointing out is the burden of uh, illnesses burden of illness the uh, the case load that the casualty uh, doctors present Yeah, the numbers. Yes. Of, yeah. Yeah, and also with the hugely patriarchal medical system, wherein we like we bow down when there's a extremely rich VIP patient comes, and if it's like any person who comes under a vulnerable group, be it mental illness or this transgender people, we just tend to like it's we think of them as social inferiors. That's an ingrained thought in many doctors, right? Hmm. So um, I have two responses to that. I don't know if you have. Any. I have one response to that. Uh, I think the numbers, this <laughs> notion of increased numbers, will um, will be a barrier to this kind of thinking is probably flawed. As in, um, if we have been learn, I mean, it might be because we have learned that way. through our medical system that we are not able to do that when there are huge numbers but if we have inculcated inculcated any time during our lifetime to think about these things i think even with short duration that we spend with a patient or with huge burden of patients these things naturally come into our thought i'm not saying it comes to my thought but i've seen a clinician who actually does this in his pg opd was an orthopedic in, in in his way i am so i maybe that is one thing um, and probably in such busy practice where you do not have enough time to reflect on what we, we are doing i think regular reflective sessions where you are presenting 
practice reflection i think these are some things that wait sure. i was also going to tell the same thing uh, the first thing you said where um, i think uh, whatever whatever it is it should become easier and faster when we practice it so mm -hmm. uh, be it uh, examination or be it uh, thinking about classifications or be it whatever it is so uh, it's only uh, one one it will definitely decrease uh, the uh, the time we have to spend will definitely decrease when when we become better at it but then even then the number of people that is a concern i was uh, actually discussing in with swati you know community clinics when we were uh, when we had gone last week uh, the number of people we had to see and the time we had uh, was not matching uh, so it, we cannot do justice to someone without spending at least half an hour with them and uh, that at least uh, at least for now and uh, we had like 10 or uh, for 12 patients waiting and we could uh, we had only like six or uh, six hours maybe even less four hours uh, yeah four hours uh, before the entire place would close because we started at uh, 2 230 and uh, people had to leave uh, close the office and go so then uh, it becomes impossible to do the thing with everyone and uh, see everyone and in places where uh, people can't be sent back, like government hospitals, uh, it becomes a big problem uh, if we if we tell uh, that these kinds of thinking also has to be incorporated into the uh, care delivery. But then uh, that is a bigger problem in in the sense the answer should not be that. I mean, I am I am not saying you are in you insinuated that meaning. But uh, we should not, we, we need to find out how to solve that, where the numbers are big, correct. But how do we tackle those numbers? This is a, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's a big opportunity to uh, innovate and uh, find answers. I agree on that. Actually, when you were talking about this high numbers, I felt like, we usually don't spend that much time when we know a person already. I, I remember um, like a few general consultations that I've seen who come for follow up. It's much lesser time that we spend on the same person. Correct. If we know their history, we, we already know where they live. We know how they, how they live, their usual social problems, etc, etc. I, I know Savinita is in Delhi, she has this, this problem, etc, etc. Then it is probably shorter duration. So maybe building long term relationship is one soft science solution. I don't know. Hmm. Especially when we're talking about casualty settings or a triad settings, right? Where do you want that? That's the scenario there. That's the exact opposite. In family medicine, I agree that's there. Yeah. In casualty, that one is there. I yes. just come more in terms with what Akshay just said. Like accepting that numbers is a problem. Like thinking of innovative ways to address that issue, both in a social point of view as well as in a technological point of view, right? Don't you think because both are practicing in those two domains, you can also think of some innovative methods in which we can address that issue, right? Like one example is actually a uh, actually it's so much highlighted for the transgender man, a shared decision approach where the nurse actually gave weightage to the symptoms that he presented with, right? Do you think so? Uh, so uh, I think uh, we have actually run out of our time, and uh, <laughs> right. no, it's a eight. Uh, we were decided for half an hour, and this since this will go on YouTube, we can't go on. For <clears throat> But I just wanted to tell Swati that even with uh, that, uh, the, you're basically talking about primary health care approach. But then the number of people that a primary health care uh, doctor is responsible for in the community mm. is actually very big. Yeah. Even in our clinic, we are responsible for 2000 people in that uh, office. We shouldn't be. We, we shouldn't be, we can't be. Mm. But then uh, if with such numbers, even in primary care or family medicine, uh, 
it's uh, we have to think of a different uh, uh, many different approaches mm. i just uh, wanted to make that point uh, 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 if we if we do not have anything at the moment we can discuss about this uh, uh, primary healthcare the i mean actually that makes for a very good next uh, topic uh, what are the principles of primary healthcare and how does it uh, ensure that some of these problems are taken care of uh, we can probably discuss that next week uh, and if there's nothing else we can close this call and, and continue our conversation on uh, next week or on the group and then next week then i mean uh, did you have any other comments to make uh, no 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 we were just uh, we, we were just hung on that question right of how to like address that issue that's all yeah 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 i mean that's we have to do it in installments at least for the sake <laughs> fine so I, i'll just cut the call and uh, stop the recording bye bye bye